Good afternoon, my name is James Bailey and I'm the Adaptive Tech Coordinator for the University of Oregon. And welcome to today's event entitled People with Disabilities, Technology, and the Law presented by Tim Spofford. Tim wanted me to uh, point out there's a handout that you can get when you, when you came in and if you didn't, you can get it on the way out. The handout is also, there's a, uh, it's available on the web as a PDF. <clears throat> Tim recently retired after 25 years as a senior staff attorney for the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights. Taking leave from OCR, Tim was the AT coordinator for Mount Hood Community College for four years. I think this gives him a unique experience of dealing with these issues, technology, colleges, people with disabilities, from both sides of the fence. He's a truly uh, unique individual. And we're fortunate to have him with us today. Tim. Okay. Um, hi. Um, let me get a sense right off the bat about what kind of group we got here. There's a few people I know from other contexts. How many people here are students? How many? How many people here are instructional of one sort or another? That leaves a huge group, but what categories are we missing? <laughs> <laughs> How many people here are service providers? A lot, there we go. How many people here are administration of one sort or another? A lot. Okay. Is there a category that I didn't mention that you're really dying to have us know about? Unemployed. There you go. Uh, much bigger group these days than it once was. And I've been on campus all day and I don't think I've heard anybody mention football, which I find very strange. But um, Yeah, I'm a retired OCR lawyer. I retired right before I turned 65. You can't really retire real young as a federal government lawyer. Um, so I point out that I am 65 years old. I do pace around a lot too, just so you know, uh, when I'm doing this. Uh, they're filming and I may or may not stay on camera, but I'm not watching it, so we won't worry about it. Uh, James, James and I have known each other for years and years. We, some of you know about the organization ORAHEAD, Oregon uh, Association for Higher Education and Disabilities. We've both been members of that for a long time, even while I was practicing law with the Office for Civil Rights. Uh, we, because we both have done AT sorts of things, uh, we've been at conferences together in other parts of the country as well as locally. And um, he saw that I was retired and I was no longer bound in my opinions by the party line for the Office for Civil Rights, as I was when I was representing the agency. So he asked me if I'd come down and talk. I, I am going to just talk about some legal standards and how they play out and do some hypotheticals uh, and see where we go. We can have a conversation, although please hold questions at least initially until we see how it goes. Um, we're really here to talk about well, let me, let, me, let me say something else. I am often asked when someone is told that they need to make a website accessible or they need to make software accessible, where in the law does it say that? Uh, it's a very common question. I've been getting it for years. And the law in question goes back since before a great many of you were born. The law passed in 19, 1973 and the regulations enacted in 1977 for Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act has the requirements for making technology accessible. Now, it doesn't talk about technology. It says a recipient of federal financial assistance, which in this case means the University of Oregon, must make its programs and activities accessible to people with disabilities as one form of preventing discrimination. That requirement that programs and activities be made accessible includes technology, technology that didn't exist in 1973 or 1977. So the requirement was there before the technology was. Now everybody talks about the ADA. 
Americans with Disabilities Act. Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990, and so it's 20 years old this year, or last year, this year. Um, funny thing about the ADA, we talk about it all the time, we hear about it all the time. In this context of a university, uh, of a, of a uh, state university, there are, with one exception, there are no requirements that are imposed under the ADA that didn't already exist for 15 years under Section 504. Americans with Disabilities Act Title II, which is the part that applies to public entities, uses the same language in the law and the same language in the regulations, with very minor exceptions, as Section 504 did. It just reinforced the law and was primarily enacted Title II as opposed to Title III, which applies to public entities, and Title I, which applies to employment. Title II was really, wasn't an afterthought by any means, but it was intended only to apply to public entities that for some reason were not covered by Section 504. Since the vast majority of public entities were already covered by Section 504, they received federal money, and certainly colleges and universities and community colleges and school districts and high schools and grade schools all got federal money for various purposes. They already had these requirements not discriminate, not to discriminate based on disability. So the issue then became, okay, now we're looking at this technology stuff. What does that mean in this context? What does that mean? Some of you remember when we started, when we first started using desktop computers, probably with DOS, maybe early Apple machines. And some of you couldn't access them. Um, you couldn't use them. And then people started coming up with software that would allow some degree of use. The problem was as the access software and hardware came along, the technology kept jumping forward as well. So it made it problematic. Now ideally, Every time there was a new development, technological information technology development, part of that development would have been accessibility. But we all know that that didn't really happen. Still, the law's been there all the time. Uh, I'm going to walk you through just some of the particulars about how the requirement is drawn from the statutes, and then I'm going to talk about some pending developments that could have a big impact on all of this. Then I'm going to throw out some hypotheticals, and then I'm going to open it up. So in terms of what's the scope of the non-discrimination requirement, as I said, it's all programs and activities of the university. That doesn't mean just educational programs. That does not mean it, it applies to programs, activities on campus, including non-academic programs. It applies to distance learning. It applies to college-sponsored off-campus programs. It applies to athletic and extracurricular activities. And it either there's a provision that prohibits discrimination by the university with respect to significant assistance, quote unquote, to an outside entity. Significant assistance is a term of art. It doesn't come up very often in the cases, but I've had one that involves significant activity, and they're out there every once in a while. I could not give you an example, I mean, I could give you the example of the one case that I had, uh, and there's one reported, important reported case I could tell you about, but I'm not sure much is to be gained by it because they're very rare. But it does extend even beyond functions of the university itself uh, in some cases. Under both laws, Section 504 and Title II, the university has some general requirements. It cannot deny, and I'm reading because there are quotes, cannot deny qualified people with disabilities the opportunity to participate in or benefit from the university programs. Well, you can see if you've got a class that's conducted in part through accessing a website and somebody can't, because of disability, access that website or the application that runs on it, you've already got a case where somebody has been denied the opportunity to participate in or benefit from the university program. So number one area where this responsibility to make things accessible comes up. Cannot provide any aid, benefit, or service that is, quote, not as effective as that provided to people without disabilities. And let me just digress to talk about a particular example here. And this is one that I started thinking about really when my son was 
uh, at Washington State about 10 years ago, and that was about the period where I really became aware of how much student interaction with the university had shifted from face-to-face -to, -face, uh, to online. My son, I mean, I asked him one time, he hadn't been in a university office in like a year and a half because everything happened online or in the classroom, but he had no need to go to an office for anything. Um, and one summer, my son was registering for his fall classes from home, hanging around watching TV and logged on and registering for his fall classes. And I started thinking about the fact the discrimination inherent in that, not because a student who could not use the registration site couldn't register, they could do it by telephone, they could do it as a walk-in, they could do it with somebody else helping them. But what they couldn't do was what my son was able to do, which is log on at two o'clock in the morning in his underwear after he'd been out partying all evening and sign up for his classes for the fall term. And I said, that's discrimination. I don't have to tell you that. You're aware of that. But that was the first time this sort of concept that we that we were talking about more than just access to the to the information. We were talking about timely, uh, equally effective, equally convenient access to the information. There are many kinds of information sources that are delivered through information technology that some people with some disabilities are never going to be able to access in a fully equivalent manner. But what we're striving for and what the law requires is comparability to the greatest extent possible. And that, that includes uh, considerations of the medium, the format, the timeliness, uh, and the, the usefulness. And all of those are covered by both Section 504 and Title II. There's also a provision in both laws, Title II and Section 504, that the university cannot provide different services to people with disabilities, except, except when it's necessary to be as effective as those provided to others. So there may be a case where, or a situation, I shouldn't say a case, I will use that loosely, I don't always mean a legal case. There will be a situation, for example, where, um, Somebody has to go see James in the library, in the AT lab, in order to be provided with a software application that will allow that person to access university information. Um, they may not be accessing the information exactly the same as someone without a disability or with a different disability, but it's necessary and permissible in that case because that's how it's made um, as effective as the information provided to others. Title II, I said, you'll remember a few minutes ago, I said Title II in one respect differs from Section 504 in its requirements for universities. There's a provision in Title II, the Title II regulations, called communications. Uh, those of you who have studied this area, I'm sure, are familiar with this provision because it's talked about a lot. Excuse me. <coughs> And I'm sorry, I didn't forget to shut off the mic before I coughed. Title II regulation says communications with people with disabilities must be as effective as communications with non-disabled persons. Now, you could get there under Section 504 in the Section 504 regulations, but it was not specific. Title, Title II ADA came along 13 years after the Section 504 regs. We had experience dealing with them. We had um, advocates uh, who had advocated for greater coverage in the new regulations, and so this was added. That's a very important provision. It's a very important provision in this area we're talking about, about information technology and access, because websites, for example, websites, the information conveyed over when websites, the information conveyed over other applications, internet, getting ahead of myself, internet-based applications is communications under that section. So we're a little bit closer and a little bit less generalizing uh, than we were prior to 1977 in what the legal basis for this. This is also the section that especially those of you who are service providers 
for people with disabilities and, and who are people with disabilities themselves that you're probably very aware of this section. It says primary consideration must be given to the request to a person with disabilities as to the nature of a particular uh, auxiliary aid or accommodation. But it also says the school is not required to honor a preference if equally or more effective alternatives are available and the university can show that they're equally more effective are equally or more effective. What does that section mean? Let's say, um, right, I got a hypothetical on this, I'm trying to decide whether to leave it. Let's say, uh, let's say you're a student who is blind and you have used uh, Wind Vision as a screen access program throughout your academic career and you come to the University of Oregon and you know you need screen access software and you go and see James and James says, I'm sorry, I don't have wind vision. I've got JAWS. It's installed throughout the university. And you say, but Title II says you've got to give primary consideration to my preferences. James at that point can say, I understand, but JAWS is as effective or more effective than wind vision. I'll help you learn it, but we're not going to give you wind vision going to use JAWS. It's an equally or more effective alternative to the preference of the student who wanted wind vision. Now, as a practical matter, I don't know if there is anything except JAWS anymore, James. Don't they sort of have 100% of the market? Yes, sir. Um, another requirement that's important that is in both statutes, or both sets of regulations, and that is that the access and the accommodations must be provided in the most integrated setting appropriate. This means, in my opinion, that a school, I'm going to give him equal time. <laughs> this means, in my opinion, that a school should strive not to have a separate accessible technology lab. That accessible te technology can be provided in place anywhere on the university campus in any of the classrooms. Uh, and that's, I think that's what that section says, but it's also a philosophical dispute. Now there's somebody else in the room who won't be named who's a, a good advocate. She doesn't know I respect her for this. A good advocate for universal design, and I think the same principle comes up. If, you're, if you can provide accessibility on every computer on campus just as part of the normal um, image for that computer and provide the same applications and access to the same applications otherwise on that computer, why not do it? Sure, there's issues of licensing and of costs that you got to work out, but isn't it preferable that if students without disabilities, able-bodied people can sit down at any computer on campus, log on and start doing whatever it is they want to do, that people with disabilities should be able to do the same thing. Well, that's what universal design, implementation of universal design would give you, and I think what this section at least idealizes and what we should strive for. And I think we've all, most of us have been dealing with this for so long that this next point I don't really have to make, but I will anyway, which is that the law requires the school to provide appropriate uh, auxiliary aids when necessary. There are exceptions to that, but they're, they're fairly um, uncommon. Um, but the, the responsibility is on the student. I think we all know that. I mean, sorry, on the university. <laughs> Spoke. Okay, a couple of exceptions. The university is not required to change academic requirements that are essential to the student's course of instruction. That's in section 104.44 of the 504 regulation, which is on the handout. Uh, it's 34 CFR part 104, for those of you who are keeping score. OCR does give deference tries to give deference to academic decisions of the university, particularly when it comes to program modifications. At the same time, the school requires, the, uh, the OCR requires the agents, the, boy, I'm having a rough time here, not enough coffee. Um, 
OCR requires the university to prove uh, that academic, that deference to the academic decisions is warranted. It can't be something that's just thrown out there as a nominal justification for the school's desire not to accommodate the student. You have to actually show that it's a reasonable academic decision. But there are, certainly there are times when OCR is backed off of situations um, because they were seen as purely academic, even though they might have implications for um, access. Two different hole punches on the same document makes it hard to work. Okay, I said, I said that Section 504 was passed in 1974. The regulations were issued in 1977 after a lawsuit and a sit-in in the HEW building in San Francisco. Some of my former colleagues were there at the time. Um, and the, the, eight, the Office of Health, Education, and Welfare, uh, which is predecessor to today's Department of Health and Human Services and today's Department of Education, were housed in UN Plaza right in front of City Hall in San Francisco in an old Georgian style federal building and a group of people with disabilities primarily and their supporters, friends and family and supporters, occupied the building for somebody here may know is taking disability history, but it was like 43 days or something to force, force the agency, my former employer, to issue regulations to implement Section 504, because until that, all we had was the statute itself and no guidance about how it was supposed to be implemented. And it, as a result, uh, the, the purpose of the act was not really being realized. Some would argue it was way after, for many years after that, it wasn't being realized, and even today, but that's a different discussion. The regulations were issued uh, in 1977. Then the ADA was passed by Congress in 1990, and regulations followed shortly thereafter, after a period of comment and review and revision. Um, something else happened in 1990, which those of you who are younger may not realize that, for me, it seems like recent history, uh, because I was online before that, primarily, but the World Wide Web was invented in 1990. There was no World Wide Web before 1990. There was an internet. There were even applications that ran on the internet, but there was no World Wide Web. There were no browsers. There were no point and click and graphics and music and all of that stuff before 1990. In fact, the first graphical browser that became available to users didn't happen until 1993. Listen to this. This is 1994. This is a quote, 1994. Mosaic, which was the original graphical browser. Mosaic is the celebrated graphical browser that allows, and browsers in quotation marks, browser that allows users to travel through the world of electronic information using a point and click interface. Mosaic's charming appearance encourages users to load their own documents onto the net, including color photos, sound bites, video clips, and hypertexts, links to other documents. By following the links, click and the linked document appears. You can travel through the online world along paths of whim and tuition. I love that. That was Wired, that was Wired Magazine in November 1994. I have, I have a quote here, or not a quote, but a statistic from 13 years later, during all of our memories, 2007, Internet World Stats said 1.1 billion people we're using the internet during any given month. Uh, I dare say, especially with what's happened in China in the last few years, but elsewhere as well, that that number has probably doubled or even tripled since then. But that was the statistic I found. So there's all this 1.1 billion of us in 2007 who are surfing the internet, <laughs> um, who are on the internet getting information, looking up things we don't know, communicating, going to class, on and on and on, making travel reservations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, there's a significant proportion of our population who can't do that. It was about the same time when people found it necessary to sue Southwest Airlines. 
because they couldn't access the Southwest Airlines uh, website to buy tickets. And unbelievably, for technical reasons, they lost that case, and unfortunately. But um, they had less to do with the, with the issue of accessibility than it did with what, whether, whether the statute covered virtual communities as opposed to, or virtual businesses as opposed to businesses with a brick and mortar component. Uh, so it, was, it was, didn't go directly to the issue of accessibility at websites. Still, people were frustrated, people were, pardon the expression, pissed off, and people were going to court because they couldn't access the internet. Now I'm gonna jump up for a minute to a more recent event in the context of what I just said about 2007 and Southwest Airlines. In June of this year, four or five months ago, the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights said the following, companies that do not consider accessibility in their website or product development will come to regret that decision because we intend to use every tool at our disposal to ensure that people with disabilities have equal access to technology and the worlds that technology opens up. So that's three years, that was the first time I'm aware of where the Attorney General or the Office of the Attorney General of the United States made, I mean, it's, it's, it's earth-shaking that the Department of Justice would make that absolute and strong a statement. We intend to use every tool at our disposal to ensure that people with disabilities have equal access to technology. Now that intention may not have been realized and probably won't be for a while. But the mere fact that it was said, the mere fact that resources are being put behind it uh, is encouraging. Two more events, though, or actually three. Some of you may have heard about the Kindle cases. There was a series of cases filed with the Office for Civil Rights last year, 2009, maybe late 2008, I forget, which alleged that Kindle reading machines which had been adopted for pilot programs at Reed College, and I apologize, but I no longer remember the others. There were four colleges, and then two more were added later, the local one being Reed. Alleged that the schools had participated with Amazon in a pilot program to use Kindles on campus as primary uh, text platform, replacing books and replacing PDFs and replacing other things, and it was gonna be all Kindles. It was just a pilot. Kindles, uh, and some of you may know this from personal experience, Kindles could read the text, that wasn't the problem. The problem was that Kindles didn't have any means to navigate. Couldn't run the menus, you couldn't go forward, couldn't go backwards, you could just, if you could get to it, if somebody would load it up for you, navigate to where you wanted to be, then it would read the text to you. Uh, not all that useful and definitely not accessible. So, complaints were filed with OCR and a couple with Department of Justice and within a fairly short period of time, those schools abandoned the pilot with Kindle. They signed a settlement agreement with the Office for Civil Rights or in a couple of cases with the Department of Justice saying that they would not adopt the Kindle or any other reading machine until uh, ensuring uh, that it was usable by people with disabilities, including but not limited to people who are blind and they suffered a whole lot of embarrassment. Um, it was, it, it, as you may or may not remember, it got a lot of press, a lot of press, uh, and, it, and it was embarrassing to those schools. At the same time, Amazon announced, and I, I am not aware that they have issued an upgrade that takes care of the problem, but Amazon announced that the next significant version upgrade of Kindle would be fully accessible in the ways that were problematic earlier. I don't think that's happened yet. But I'm not an Apple, so one of the people says no. Uh, I'm not an Apple user except for my phone, so I'm not entirely up to date with that. But. Um, so those, those Kindle cases. Then the Department of the Assistant Attorney General and the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights of the Department of Education issued a joint statement, it's called a Dear colleague letter, and it goes to the presidents of all the universities in the United States. 
The guidance mandated accessibility for Kindles and other, quote, emerging technologies. Excuse me, I gotta, I gotta fix this for myself. Joint guidance mandating accessibility for Kindles and other emerging technologies. Well, that's very, um, very far reaching. Before colleges can purchase or require or recommend such devices. Uh, I, have, I have a good friend whose son just sold his company to Twitter and moved to Berkeley to be a Twitter, a Twitter geek. Um, and there is no doubt in my mind that to the extent Twitter may be used for any kind of academic purpose at least or for any university function that it's, that it's covered by this. Um, they also said it is unacceptable, uh, unacceptable for universities to use emerging technology without, without insisting that this technology be accessible to all students. Again, a very strong statement in light of what we heard from the federal government leadership about technology up until this time. But that's not the last of the events. In July of this year, the Department of Justice, the U.S. Department of Justice, issued an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking for accessibility of web information and services provided by entities covered by the ADA under Titles II and three. What this says, for the, what this will do for the first time, and I'll explain it in a little more detail in a minute, but what this will do for the first time is impose a specific legal requirement on entities subject to Title II, which is all public entities, including all public colleges and universities, and under Title III, which are public accommodations will impose a specific requirement under the Americans with Disabilities Act regulations to make their technology accessible, in particular web technology, web information. But it goes beyond that. In issuing the advance notice of proposed rulemaking, the Attorney General said there is no doubt, quote unquote, that state and local websites are covered by Title II and by Section 504. We've debated that issue for years. Not because we thought, didn't think the law required it, we did, but do we have the enforcement authority? Did we as OCR have the enforcement authority? That no doubt is compelling. This advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, what it does is say that, and those of you that have the handout or get the handout in a PDF, it's got the citation so you can look at it for yourself. What it says, uh, what it does is say, we are planning to issue regulations in this area. Here's why we're doing, here's why we're planning to issue regulations. Here's the process we're going through. We would like your comments. We're going to have public hearings in San Francisco in January, Washington, D.C. in December, and somewhere else in November. And here's 19 questions we would like you as affected members of the public to consider and give us feedback on. Those questions involve such things as which access accessibility standards should we apply? Should we use Section 508, which parenthetically does not apply to state universities now, much to many people's surprise? Section 508 required the federal government to uh, have accessible technology, but it had no application to the states. It was only the federal government. I just met with a group of people, some of whom in this some of whom are in this room who were quite surprised when I said, you know, 508 doesn't apply to you because they had been using 508 as their standard all along. Um, question posed in the advance notice of proposed rulemaking is, should we use the 508 standard, which, which is itself being amended, or should we use the World Wide Web W3C accessibility guidelines as the standard? Very specific. Uh, there are a number of other questions about the practicalities, about the scope, about the cost, but what is very clear, if tomorrow doesn't have any impact on it, and I don't think the way the regulatory process works that it should have an impact on it, uh, two, 2012 might, but I don't think tomorrow will, 
what it makes clear is that the government and the Department of Justice in particular as the lead agency is moving forward with specific requirements to be imposed on state and local governments and public entities regarding web accessibility. It's huge in my opinion. Um, it's going to be a while after the advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Then, the, then they'll take it back and the lawyers will rewrite it and work and try and consider all the comments and incorporate those that make sense. And there will be some internal discussions and the different federal agencies, including most particularly the Department of Education and the Office for Civil Rights, but others as well, and the Access Board but they'll, and the EEOC. But they'll all get together and they'll argue about it and they'll send drafts back and forth. And then in a year, year and a half, two years, we'll see a notice of proposed rulemaking. Not an advance notice, but a notice of proposed rulemaking. That will be specific draft regulations, very specific language. Here's what we're going to do. And then if it follows the usual practice, there will be another set of comments invited. And then the regulation will possibly be revised again. Typically what happens in these kinds of cases is the agency will summarize all the comments and recommendations and requests it had from the public about provisions of the regulations and it will either accept those and make a change or if it does not it will say that it's not accepting that recommendation and why. So it's a drawn out process. I don't expect to see these in final before 2012, probably late in 2012 at the earliest. It could be later than that. But the train has started moving out of the station and I, as I say I just think it's huge. For those of us who care about web accessibility, uh, there's no turning back on this, I don't think. I don't see how there could be. And it's common sense. It's common sense to every one of you that with the role that the web and web-based applications play in our lives today, that it's got to be accessible. I mean, it's as important or more important, well, I shouldn't speak for people with disabilities because I'm not affected by these particular things, but it, I was going to say it's as important as building access. Uh, and I suppose that's a matter for each person subjectively to decide for themselves, but it's very, very important. Enough said about that. Watch it. The citation for the current uh, advance notice is in the handout and in the PDF. Um, if you care, read it. If you care, comment on it. Department of Justice would be happy to hear your comments and your input. So, that is the one that, let me find my copy and then I can tell you specifically. It's on the, sec the back of the page where it says proposed amendment of the ADA Title II and Title III regulations. And the citation, if anyone is uh, taking notes and can't read the handout, the citation is www.ada.gov slash ANPRM for advance notice of proposed rulemaking. ANPRM 2010 slash web space ANPRM underscore 2010 dot htm. Now, I have, an, I have a, I have a uh, template for, it's sort of my own, although other people use it as well, about access tools. That includes all of James's assistive technology. Um, it includes applications that are put on the web with the intent of providing accessibility or making content accessible. And here's my five point criteria. To comply with the law, it's got to be available. That is, it's got to be where someone who needs it can get it. It's got to be working. I think the days are 
somewhat less common than it used to be where I'd go on a campus and I'd say, you got any assistive technology? And they would say, yeah, we got a machine somewhere that talks and blind people can use it. And I'd say, great, where is it? And they'd say, well, it's over in the library. Let's go over, we'll take a look. And we'll walk in the library and then we'll go in this back room and there'll be a little desk with no light and a computer and a chair that's got stuff piled on it and dust. And I'll try and boot up the computer and it won't boot up. And that's their assistive technology lab or their assistive technology. It's got to be available. It's got to be working. It's got to be current, not obsolete software. Uh, I used to run into that a lot too. They'd have, well, we, yeah, we got assistive technology. We bought, we bought Zoom text. Uh, I think it's the DOS version, but it, we've got it. It's got to be current. In most cases, it's got to be com commonly accepted and widely available. That is, you don't want to be going out and buying some esoteric, obscure, assistive technology that nobody else in the world uses. A, it's not going to be supported probably for very long. Um, and B, you're going to have big training issues with it. And last, and in some ways the most important, it's got to be compatible with the institution's computing environment. If your university is mostly uh, XP and um, Windows 7, and you've got a assistive technology that runs on a, uh, a Macintosh, except for those people who are in programs that use a Macintosh, that's not an acceptable access device. You can't require people to use Macintosh as much as you may like Macs. You can't require people to use Mac assistive technology if your entire computing environment is Windows or Unix. Uh, it's just, it's, it's not real access. Um, access to web information. I'm really not planning, don't want to get too much into the technicalities of it. For one thing, the te technology has so passed me by over the last couple of years. Um, but just by way of exam, and, and technology questions, I'm going to refer to James, you know. I'm a retired lawyer. <laughs> um, I used to do all this technology stuff, but it's been a while, so I'm not up to date. But there are some basic principles for accessible websites, at least. You've got to have alt text for graphics. Reading, uh, screen access software will not read images, will not read pictures. They don't now, and they probably never will, although I'm not willing to predict more than two years into the future the way things are now, but they probably won't for at least a while during my lifetime. So how do you deal with the fact that, that screen access software, i.e. JAWS or e.g. JAWS, won't read pictures? Well, you describe it, and you build the description into the website. I I would like to say that most people who are doing web content have learned this by now, but they don't because I keep seeing it. Here's an example of bad alt text. Picture of a man. Do you understand what I'm saying when I say alt text? Does everybody understand? So bad alt text. Picture of a man. Well, that tells me absolutely nothing. I mean, there's a picture there and apparently there's some guy in it, but so what? Here's an example of good alt text. A portrait of Martin Luther King Jr. wearing his clerical collar and appearing to be in his mid-30s. That's good alt text. Here's another bad alt text. Logo. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen them. I'm not kidding. Good alt text. U of O duck logo in full green and yellow regalia. So somebody knows what they're looking at, even if they can't see it. Now, they may not understand green and yellow, but at least they'll know it's colorful. Um, some other sort of basics, color and typeface considerations, consistency in style and navigation. That can be an awful problem where you've got a huge web with lots of subwebs and stuff, and every page you go to is built differently, different style. There's no, you have to sort of discover your way through each new page you go to. Um, it's not nice if you're sighted or, or without disabilities that would impede your use of the site, but uh, if, if 
you are in that category, it's just awful. Um, and I went on a new website to me yesterday. There was, I can't remember what it was, there was something I was after. And it was obviously built by an amateur. Uh, and they had all the information I wanted, but it just went on and on and on. I mean, it was built sort of like a blog that had never been archived. So you had every entry that they ever did all on that one single page. Um, but it was worse than that. It wasn't a blog. It was just paragraphs that just, they just kept adding to the top of. Uh, that's, that's awful web design, and it's even more awful web design when you're trying to be accessible. Sound is a big issue, too, and sound is a lot tougher. Um, folks are working on it. They're making progress, but, uh, and it is required that that audi audible information be conveyed uh, in a way that's accessible. But I think we're a little farther ahead with respect to uh, user manual user faces and to site issues than we are vis uh, vision issues than we are with sound. But it's it's just as required. I guess I should have shared this stuff in an earlier meeting. I'm not going to do it here covered most of it. So, coming up on an hour, I want to do, I want to just throw out some hypotheticals. And the group is small enough that I'm going to give you a hypothetical. I'm going to ask just anybody to chip in what they think, one or two or three responses, and then I'm going to tell you what I think. Uh, what you think may be just as valuable or more so than what I think. I just tell you that up front. But they're my hypotheticals. So. Um, are you getting the microphone, James? And then after that, we'll do questions. So here's first hypothetical. Tim. Yes. Is this a good time for the reporter's break? We want to do a break? That's fine with me. And then we'll do the hypotheticals afterwards. Very short break. Raise your hand, and James will get to you. And uh, and let me tell you, I'm looking at these from the perspective of an OCR lawyer. If this came to me as a complaint with OCR, you know, before we do the hypotheticals, we've got time. I should take a minute. You know, I no longer work for this. I should take a minute to see if there are any questions about a what OCR is, uh, b what their function is and see how does their complaint law enforcement process work. Would people like me to spend a minute and do that? I see a couple of nods, yeah? Okay, this, this is the five minute version. The Office for Civil Rights was created in HEW, Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, way back in the, in the fog, the mists of time, um, long time ago. There's still a couple of original people around um, it was originally charged with enforcing Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, or national origin. And one of the main things that OCR did in its early days was school, Southern College desegregation cases, also school district cases. Um, but it was, all, it was exclusively race stuff. Uh, then Title IX of the Education, I'm trying to remember the chronology, Title IX of the Education Amendments, or the, the Title IX of the Higher Education Amendments of 1972 was passed. Title IX prohibits discrimination, I'm sure you're all aware of this, Title IX prohibits discrimination based on sex in educational institutions. We hear about it the most, or most commonly, and some people think it only applies to athletics, but in fact it applies throughout the institution to prohibit discrimination based on sex or gender, if you prefer, although I think sex is the correct word. Um, and OCR was given that authority. 
Then Section 504 was passed a year later, and OCR was given that authority. In 1989 or 90, is that right? Let me think for a second. No, it was earlier than that. 1979, the Department of Education and the Department of Health and Human Services were created out of the old Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. And what happened within OCR, basically the short version, is about one-third of the employees of OCR went to HHS and two-thirds went to education and they became two separate OCRs with different missions, different responsibilities. OCR of the Department of Education is, I believe, the second largest civil rights agency in the federal government after only the EEOC. It's larger than the civil rights, by quite a few, it's larger than the civil rights division of the Department of Justice. Uh, they're the more powerful. They've, they've got the clout and the macho, but uh, OCR is bigger and more widespread, and they're the ones that you will mostly hear from in edu about educational matters. OCR, it, they added a couple other statutes afterwards. The Age Discrimination Act of some year that I don't remember, which prohibits, there, is, there are two age discrimination acts. One is Age Discrimination and Employment Act, which is enforced by the EEOC. That's, that's one law. There's a second one, Age Discrimination Act, which prohibits discrimination in programs based on age, and there are some exceptions in it, and OCR has an enforcement responsibility for that. Don't get many cases, and of those that do, there are very few violations because of the exceptions built into the statute and the regulatory scheme. And then most recently, uh, and I can say I think that I and most of my colleagues were really put out, disgusted by this, about 10, 12 years ago, you may remember that the Boy Scouts of America refused to let gay people work as, uh, what do they call them, troop leaders or something. And as a result, a, lot, a number of school districts said, we're not going to let the Boy Scouts meet on our school property, it conflicts with our values as a community and as a school district. And so a, a couple of southern senators retaliated against the retaliation, retaliated against the school districts and said, if you don't let the Boy Scouts use your facilities on the same, uh, under the same uh, guidelines and basis as other, com you let other community groups you're going to lose all your federal money. And the responsibility enforced that was given to OCR. Now, a lot of us sided with the school districts politically and emotionally on that issue. Um, and we were, we were not happy about being given the responsibility. Um, but we do what the law requires us to do, or we quit. And that was not something that I think any of us felt um, rose to the level of quitting over it, given that we only got, in the first couple of years, I think we got six cases, and none of those really were substantial cases. But that's, their, that's OCR's last enforcement statute. Uh, very quickly, it's a, a complaint-driven law enforcement agency. People file complaints with the agency alleging that they've um, been discriminated against by an educational institution or that their child has um, or that their friend or partner has uh, been discriminated against by an educational institution on one of the prohibited grounds. Those complaints, most of those complaints these days are filed online. There's a pretty comprehensive complaint form that I created online. Um, and about 75% of the complaints come in using that method. The rest come in by mail or fax. Uh, when OCR, and it's sent automatically, the software sends it to the office that would have responsibility for it automatically. So within 20 seconds of hitting the submit button, it's in the hands of the office that's going to evaluate the complaint. Uh, they get it, they look at it, they consider whether if the things alleged were true, would it potentially constitute a violation of one of the statutes. If it does, we notify the institution, the head of the institution in the University of Oregon's case, the president. 
and the person who filed the complaint that we are opening the complaint for investigation. Come down, investigate it. Sometimes it's not necessary to come down. We come down and we talk to Hillary and other people who were, who were involved in one way or another. Uh, not that Hillary investigated. She just works with the people who filed the complaint. She knows all the facts. Um, and we make a determination as to whether the law was violated in this case. And then there are, in all these statutes, there is a requirement that the agency seek to obtain voluntary compliance, quote unquote. So we are required by law to go into negotiations. And that almost always ends the matter. The school will agree to do the things that we ask them to do to make the thing right. Um, if they refuse, we can either hook up with the Department of Justice and sue them, or we can initiate an administrative hearing to, to take away all of their federal funds, which is why they so often agree to settle and do what we ask them to do. I've only, in 25 years with OCR, I only had one case that I took to litigation in the form of an administrative hearing, and that was uh, California High School District, uh, which was discriminating against women in promotion to uh, or in hiring for administrative positions. Among other things, among, among the evidence was that they had 32 administrators in the district and they had one female assistant principal. Um, they settled in the middle of the, we were in litigation, but they settled in the middle of it. That's the only one I've ever had that went that far. Uh, so that's, that's basically how the agency works. They also do what they call compliance reviews, which are targeted reviews of particular institutions on a given subject. Uh, those are dictated out of headquarters, what institutions, and more importantly, what the subject will be in a given year, what things they're going to look at as a compliance review. And then they've got a legal responsibility, or at least a policy responsibility, to provide technical assistance. So, and that applies to any of you. If I were still an OCR lawyer and you had a question about how something worked, or should you do something, or are they treating me right, or whatever, you could call me up or send me an email, and I would try and give you some guidance on that. Um, now that I'm retired, I'll still do it. But <laughs> it's not worth as much, because the farther I get away from working for OCR, the less current my knowledge is. So. Because one of the things about retirement is I don't do legal research <laughs> unless I really have to. So that's, that's OCR. Other agencies of the federal government do have OCRs. The Department of Transportation has one. Uh, uh, who are the Homeland Security has one. I know a couple of people in that, and that's an extremely small office. They've got kind of a different model, but they only have about 25 people. Um, whereas OCR education has almost 700. Um, and others, other agencies have them. Agriculture has, I think, one person. So here's the first hypothetical. You got a business major, ask for assistive technology in the business school computing lab. The student claims that it's advantageous to work with his academic peers, that is, students with the same major. The school says, the same software is available in the AT lab, which is James's thing in the library. Plus, there is support there if the student should need it. The school denies the request. The student files a complaint with OCR saying they discriminated against me by not giving me AT uh, software in the business computing lab. What result? I, I think that the student would, would win that case because they can't um, participate with their other colleagues to gain that networking ability, et cetera. That's all part of the school environment. As a, anybody else want to say anything? As practical ma I think it would go fall into the criteria you said that the university can argue equal or better technology is available Maybe the university in the lab. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Group work in the business school is very important. So the alternative would be having any group members that were working with this student go to the AT lab with him. I don't know if that would be feasible. If that wouldn't be feasible, then they'd need to install the software in the business lab. Do they use a case study here at Harvard Business School? curriculum, basically. There's one more in the back I want to hear from, Jay. Uh, 
Um, in this case, I would argue that the student would win as well because I know that this is true on the U of O campus, that when doing group projects, if you're asking other students to go to some sort of esoteric, out of the way place where they don't know where it is and they can't find it, they're not going to do it. So therefore, the group project would be moot because the group wouldn't show up. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, all, all, four, all, all of those comments, I think, are, are good comments, and I think the student would win. The, the particular legal handle for why the student, all of those are, are practical reasons why the student should win. The legal handle is that the student's required to be provided with access in the least restrictive environment. Uh, and that means, in this case, that means in the business computer lab. Another hypothetical. Did we talk about this? Let me look at this. Okay, we got two students. We got a course in this particular department where students are told to complete assignments on the department website. You got two students who use screen access software, screen readers. One instructor stonewalls the first student. She falls behind almost immediately because she can't get access and she files a complaint with OCR. A different instructor, instructor drops the requirement for student two, um, doesn't require him to complete the assignments on the department website and lets him do it in another manner. He complains to OCR that he's not getting the same instruction as his peers. So, both students prevail, violation, just first student, I don't think we need to talk about the first student, first student's clear, they didn't give him, they weren't giving her the access, she couldn't get the stuff, she was falling behind, violation, automatic. What about the second student, where they said, we're not going to require you to do your assignments on the website, you can do them on your own computer and email them to us. Anybody got any opinions? I'll tell you, that's a very close call for me. I'll tell you my thinking on it, but it's a close call. Um, I'm thinking if it's anything like Blackboard, not only is it the assignment, but it's a community discussion of the assignment, possible help with answers, immediate instant messaging, all sorts of things that are available that doing it on your own through your email you don't get. I agree. This, that was not this hypothetical, but I agree with you that in the Blackboard case and where you've got an entire online community for your course, I think it's essential. Uh, I don't think suggesting the student go home and email the assignments in is, is sufficient. What about, though, if it's just, if we're not talking, I don't know, maybe this is a, not a reasonable question at this institution, but we're just talking about the assignments online. Would it be, would it be legally acceptable for the instructor to say, you know, I don't control that software, I can't do anything about that, but look, it, come and see me after class, I'll give you the assignments, take them home, email them to me. I would be concerned that if the student had to do it in an alternative format like that, that it would be more work than the students who were allowed to use the software. So I, I would think that the student would have a, a good cause. Yeah, that's, that's sort of where I come down. It's very fact dependent. Um, I think it's probably a violation. I'm not sure OCR would find one if we stuck to the strict facts of the, of the uh, hypothetical. It's a close call especially if the instructor has no control over the website. So it's, if the, instructor, the instructor has either got to pull everybody off it, which maybe you should do, um, or at, at, least, at least I think the instructor should go to bat with the people who control the website to make sure it's accessible. So, so the question comes to mind, why did this instructor choose that software in the first place? Yeah. <laughs> Hypothetical number three, faculty member videotapes her own lectures and posts them to YouTube. She suggests, quote unquote, that students review them but doesn't make it an assignment. The videos are not captioned. Mm -hmm. A deaf student in the class wants captioned access to the videos. In response, the department says that since 
they are optional they were only suggested or not required at the school has no obligation to ensure that they're captioned so not only is it supposedly optional but but also it's a it's a off network site it's youtube not uoregon.edu what do you think Oh, three at once. <laughs> if the instructor is making it available and telling the class about it, it seems like it's a resource for the class and ought to be available with equal access to everybody. Yeah, I think that's right. Pass the mic back behind you. I think YouTube's recent action of inserting an, an automatic captioner tells you what your responsibility should be. I was going to say the same as the first person. <laughs> if it is available for all to use, but not all can use it, then it isn't equal access. That's right. It's, uh, it's um, the f optional is not a defense. I mean, it's, it's, it's just like people say, well, it's not an academic class. Doesn't matter. It's part of the university's program by putting the stuff out there and recommending it to the class. Um, and you should caption it before you put it up there or use YouTube's uh, captioner. Now I got more hands when I express my opinion about that agrees with you <laughs> than if I had tried to argue with you. I just want to add another option which would also be having it interpreted which some people would prefer that as an additional option and sometimes it's faster to get it turned around and produ reproduced um, because the time lag behind captioning is significant. And so then the student's missing on that supplementary material. So working with the student about their preference and the best way for them to access that information as well. Should we ask our captioner for an opinion? <laughs> <laughs> I was looking when you said it takes a long time to turn around. <laughs> so here's a variation on the hypothetical. What if a student decides that to help themselves study, they would like to film a lecture Faculty member says fine, and then the student on their own decides, well, I'll put it up on YouTube to make, or wherever, to make it available to everybody. So the faculty member, it's not his idea, they, you know, they never thought about it. A student's just doing it out of the goodness of their heart to share with the rest of the class. I don't know. Oh, no, I think it's a great question. I think it's a great hypothetical. Uh, if I was still in touch with my law school professors, I'd send it to them and say, throw this one out at the class and let me know what they decide. Uh, but I don't know the answer. I mean, it's obviously the nature of the question is such that it, put it puts it farther away from being the responsibility of the university, which is what we're really talking about under both laws. It's, it's not even the faculty member whose legal responsibility we're talking about. We're talking about the university responsibility. And if it's a student who created it, a student who on, on her own made it available, and a student who on her own said, here it is for anybody that wants it, I don't know the answer. I mean, it should, the real answer is everybody should be making their stuff accessible. But I'm not here to talk about what I think everybody should do. I'm here to talk about what I think the law requires. And in that context, I, I don't know. Okay. Number four, we already talked about. That's the, like, for example, a Kurzweil reading machine versus an open book. Uh, they perform about the same function in the same way. They're equally effective. The university can give the student uh, or make available to the student, student a Kurzweil even though the student prefers the open book. Last one. I like this one. You'd be amazed at how often, well, maybe you wouldn't be amazed, but I, was, I, I found it interesting how often this kind of thing comes up with OCR. Student with a mobility impairment claims getting to campus is a barrier and asks for AT uh, assistive technology to be installed on her personal laptop. Yeah, I waited for a few heads to go, what? <laughs> or yeah, let me in on that. Um, and the school doesn't provide commercial software for student computers uh, and denies the request. The student calls OCR. What's the result? Does, does the university, students using a laptop at home as an accommodation, 
because it's an accommodation for her inability to get to school on a regular basis. So that's an accommodation. Does the school have to put to install uh, licensed commercial software on the student's personal computer? I think the real question is why is there an impediment to the student getting to school? So it's not the question of the software, if that's accessible when they're at the school, but are, is there an impediment? Stairs, for instance, or whatnot? Um, what stairs? Stairs, right? Uh, no, sort of it's, it's the fact that the student rides the bus and it's been a really bad snow winter. And the students, the bus doesn't come and the student's wheelchair gets stuck. So I just want to get okay, rid of the, yeah. I want to get rid of you the, want to get rid of the facilities access okay, issue. Okay. <laughs> I think probably the school would say that um, they're providing a facility, they're providing a location, and that that's good enough and that that meets the, the burden of, of the law. But I think that this example relates really clearly to something you said in your intro, which I thought was wonderful, which was um, the observation you made about your son's ability to multitask and to save time and to save energy by being able to register for classes at home in his underwear at three o'clock in the morning. And I think that's something that we don't recognize enough as a society is how much time and energy it still takes to have a disability and to, to um, partake in the accommodations that have been made. Um, yes, those are, are available, but it, it's the additional time and the additional energy that it takes to, to access them. Um, but I think I, probably legally that student would be told, you know, no, there's a computer lab you can come to and you need to figure out how to get here. I don't, I, there was a time when I think that's what they would be told. Um, and I think, let me, let me share with you that in 19, you know, I don't know, 1984 or something, I had a case, I was in the California office, San Francisco office, and I had a case at, I think it was Fresno State, somewhere down there in the valley. And there was a student with quite severe agoraphobia. This was before we had any kind of common access to uh, the internet. The web didn't exist yet. Um, there was not a lot of distance learning except in a very old non-technical manner. She had a severe case of agoraphobia and the school was trying to accommodate her by taking books and, and assignments to her house and picking them up and, and otherwise trying to work with her and she didn't, she wanted an, an exam to be proctored at her house and for some reason I forget why the school was, was dragging their feet. And, but the school believed that they had a responsibility to accommodate her, her agoraphobia. The way that case was decided was that she was not otherwise qualified because they had no distance learning program and she was asking for a fundamental alteration of the program in order to be able to participate without ever going to school and the ability to go to school and participate in class at that time was considered an essential element of the program and that's sort of what I heard you say, not exactly but sort of. But nowadays, here's my, here's my analysis of it. The, the school's policy of not installing, refusing to install commercial uh, university licensed software on a student's personal computer is, uh, is reasonable, administratively reasonable. At, there are liability issues associated with it. There are extensive support issues associated with it. I mean support of that in that kind of situation could just be a nightmare and there are alternatives. What I would what I would have done at my school in that kind of situation is I would have given the student I would have loaned the student an AT lab laptop that was loaded with her accommodations, her assistive technology. And that's perfectly legal. It doesn't violate the policy, you're taking a risk that you're going to lose a laptop to damage or theft or something, but it's, you know, laptops are 400 bucks these days. It's not a major deal. Um, so that's how I would approach it. Um, 
The other thing is the student, otherwise the student could be required to buy her personal AT. The, the reason I say that is let's put aside a student who is home as an accommodation and just talk about distance learning. It has always been my view, and I'm not aware of any law to the contrary, that in the distance learning context, the responsibility for the client computer, including accommodations, belongs to the student. The responsibility for the servers, including the accessibility, belongs to the university. This case, it seems to me, is analogous to the distance learning case where a student is, is taking a distance learning class and needs JAWS on her home computer in order to do that. She has to buy JAWS. The university, I don't think the law requires the university to buy her JAWS for her home computer. This is analogous to that situation, I think. The difference being that in the case of the distance learning student, there's no accommodation. The, the fact that she is doing distance learning is not an accommodation. She's just doing distance learning. In this case, the fact that the student's working from home because of her disability, because of a, 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 an effect or a consequence of her disability, makes it a little bit different. She's being accommodated by being allowed to be at work at home, but I still think she could be told, look, we'll let you, we'll let you have excessive misses. We'll get you all the work we can. We'll give you plenty of time to make up. Um, and if you want, if you can do it, if you want to buy jobs for your computer, you can participate from home and do your work. But I don't think there's a legal responsibility on the school to buy it to buy it to install on her home computer. I'm pretty sure there's not under any analysis. James, you're looking thoughtful. Oh, no, I'm just listening. In fact, <clears throat> I, would, I would agree with your position that we would prefer to prepare a laptop and loan it to the student that we could then control and support and so forth. So you, you came to the same conclusion I would have. Uh, I'm ready to just open up for questions and answers. Were you going to tape the questions and answers or not? Yes. Okay. Yep. Is there anybody who doesn't want to be on camera or have their question on camera? Nobody cares. You're all. <laughs> Nobody's going to ask any questions. Shoot, we got we got half an hour, so we can use all of it or none of it, or I can even hang around for a little while afterwards if we need to. There's somebody behind you, and then we'll get to you. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I'm blind, and when everyone was laughing, I turned around and had to ask what was going on. When, oh, when I when we, I bowed, when and, you took a bow. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Not very accessible of you. Um, I just wanted to ask, in terms of, of accessible information technology. One of the things that we're struggling with in our department, um, because a large part of our constituency are people with um, some sort of cognitive disability or learning disability that affects their ability to access large chunks of really technical text. Mm -hmm. And so one of the questions we're throwing about is, you know, uh, is do we offer a secondary version of the website, sort of like the stripped down versions for people with screen readers, which is a stripped down, simplified text, so that they get the basic information, but they don't have to weed their way through all of this really technical information and things like that, that may be causing a barrier for them. Interesting, I've not heard that before, although I understand what you're saying. Um, it, one question I would have is how much, well two questions actually, is how much of this, and without altering the content, how much of the issue could be dealt with through formatting sorts of things, and how much control would the student have over re-presenting, re accessing the information in a way that does not modify the content but is uh, more accessible to him or her. To me, it, it, it sort of, I mean, I'm glad you say you're, th you're talking about what to do in your department. To me, as an outsider, as a non-academic, to me, when you start talking about 
uh, giving, to use your words, watered down uh, content or information, I start to get nervous as an outsider, as a law enforcement person. What do we, I mean, would we ever tell a school that they've got to provide a watered down version? Uh, and I, I really don't like that term, and I don't think that's probably what you really meant, although I don't want to put words in your mouth. But, but to, I, I'm even troubled by requests to prepare a different exam for a student um, because I, I don't think, the, I, to me, that's a fundamental alteration. If you start presenting, pre requiring that different information or information in a different form or an exam in a different form, not the medium, but the content of the exam, be prepared. I'm, I'm troubled by that. If, on the other hand, it's something that the department feels comfortable doing and it can be done, it can be done, and, and can do, then, you know, I'm not going to object to it. I just, I'm telling you, as a, as a law enforcement, from a law enforcement background, it would, I would not feel comfortable uh, taking a case like that to a full investigation. Other questions or follow-up, either one? Your comment about you wouldn't want to take it to a full investigation, meaning, meaning, it would be too difficult to clarify, or no, just no, no, doubt no. About I, it? Th I think my reaction to it, if I, if that came to my desk, the complaint, I think as I was analyzing it, my reaction would be, I'm not saying after I talked to some of my colleagues about it and we brainstormed it and stuff, I would end up in the same place, but if that came to my desk today, I would say, we're not going to require them to write a separate web page to make it watered down, to deliver the information in another, uh, in, a, in a, you know, it's an academic decision whether the information is important to be conveyed to people who are taking my class. And if, if I think it's important that that information be conveyed as, a, as an element of my class, then where's the authority for telling me to water it down? Thank you. And I think, I think that would be my reaction when I saw the initial complaint, and I would recommend that it not be open for investigation. I would talk to the student first, sort of try and flesh this out and find out a little bit more about it. And, um, incidentally, I don't, I don't think this probably a it, this is probably sort of collateral for all of you, but you know, I talked about we analyze it, and if we're going to open it, then we notify the university and the student or the complainant. We we'll have lots of discussions sometimes with the complainant while we're making that determination about whether to open it or not. We'll you know ask for information, interview them, get them to tell us things that we don't quite understand from the written complaint, ask them to send us documents. We don't contact the university though until we've made the decision to open it. So we get lots of complaints that the university never hears about because they don't get opened. So Hillary thinks, oh, I've only had two OCR complaints against me in the last year. I say, no, Hillary, you've had nine, but seven of them never got opened. <laughs> I just wanted to provide a point of clarification on, on the comment about the website. Um, the, the website that she's speaking about is um, for a program that uh, is creating information for the public. So, so it wouldn't be that a, that, a, that a university student would be complaining about an inability to understand the information. It would be that, that the, there would be a fear that public constituents for whom that information is applicable would not be able to understand gotcha. it. Gotcha. Entire different so, so I think game. it's an entirely different yeah, scenario, I'm, I'm, I'm and sorry I because I work for a similar program um, that's uh, aimed at a little different population, I would make the argument that um, a program needs to be able to create materials that are appropriate to to you know that are appropriate for what they're trying to do and for who they're trying to do it for. Um, so I think that that's, that it's great if they want to change or provide an alternate format but that I wouldn't think that that could be a that that would be a legal requirement 
Uh, yeah, I completely to, misunderstood to, to the change. scenario that we were talking about. And I think right. under that circumstances, there certainly is a responsibility to do what you can to make the information available to the targeted audience in addition to, it'd be interesting to know afterwards what kind of highly technical information this is, but uh, just from my own curiosity. But, um, but yeah, I mean, if you're trying to communicate information to a particular audience, you want to make that information in a form that's accessible. Would it be would it be done as an accommodation or just as a good design element, a good writing element, plain English, to communicate it to the people that we want to understand it? Which is always a principle that I would hope we would adhere to. Uh, and we could we could think of it in accommodation terms. I don't know if that's necessary, but I can see how you could get there in that kind of instance. Um, how you could get to it being a legally required accommodation to do it. Thanks for the clarification. I see the hand. James doesn't. <laughs> we had a hand up, but no microphone. YouTube. What would an ideal uh, accommodation of YouTube be? Pull the plug. <laughs> No, seriously. Um, ideal accommodation for what disability? Uh, for a general, for a general, uh, was I was going to put a, a YouTube clip, a three-minute clip up next week, uh, and it's going to have, well, just what would be a good general accommodation? Closed captioning is that enough, or? I mean, how do you, how does YouTube... What's the information you're conveying? If it's, if it's a picture of my dog dancing, uh, there's yeah. no closed captioning involved except maybe my narration of what's going on. So, yeah. I mean, I'm being a little facetious, but... No, no. But the, the, the answer to the question depends on right. two things. The first, the main one being the nature of the information. The secondary being what's your intended audience. Tenant audiences down the list because in a in a in a medium like YouTube you you might have an intended audience but you don't have a definable audience, so you don't know. But yeah, and that it was a general question about YouTube. Thank you. Uh, captioning primarily for YouTube, and and people are much more current than I in terms of their uh, available semi-automatic captioning and how good it is. It's probably better than nothing. I just made a side comment about I'm not sure if the recognition software is better than nothing because I've seen things using the recognition software which is oftentimes way off compared to what the actual um, material is. So I would just say real captioning. Yeah, I see the same thing with Google Translate too. For I mean, I know enough of a few, very little, but enough of a few languages to know that whatever they're saying is not what that said. <laughs> Somewhat along the same lines, if you have a website targeted toward the public, um, and what is would a bulleted list of to-do items be on that? Closed captioning for video, audio, uh, and um, alt tags. What else would be in that bulleted list? Um, you could, you know, the the best bulleted list out there, and James can give you this. I don't have the citation off the top of my head, but the best bulleted list out there is the 11 or 12, 508. Uh, elements for accessibility under the original 508 guidelines. It's a nice short one line a piece, right to the to the point. But um, you got you got color and contrast considerations. You got flashing considerations. Flashing is not the problem it used to be because we've grown up a little bit, thankfully, um, in terms of our web development. Um, we're not all ooh the web. Um, uh, what else, James? Can you can you do those off the top of your head? Well, it depends. There's forms, tables, and accessible tables is a big one for navigation, which is not in 508, but um, headers, which you actually put in uh, headings, because the screen reader can now navigate from heading to heading. And it allows you to, your reader, using a screen reader, to, to get through and summarize your page very quickly. So you want to use headings and you want to use them hierarchically in a way, you know, H1, H2, H3, 
H4, and then the screen reader can work off of that. And Adobe does the same thing. Acrobat does the same thing. That's what helps make Acrobat accessible. I just wanted to say, if you're interested in that topic, then reading the uh, W3C guidelines on the top on the subject are pretty good. I mean, it's not too technical, but it has a good set of bold-faced points about how to address each of those things, and also a few other things about um, general guidelines. I agree with that. The, the only reason that I suggest 508 uh, sometimes is that it's it's about my level of sophistication. <laughs> uh, and and it, it does function as a bulleted list where, uh, you know, I think WC3 is is pretty technical, really. I mean, you know, if you if you can if you can skim through the stuff that doesn't apply to your situation, uh, filter a bit. But yes. Um, I had a question of, as far as IT access, is there any responsibility for the university to help a student who who may need uh, IT assistance identify possible? Uh, tools that they could use if you know I mean a lot of us show up these days with our own IT and we're pretty well married to our own IT so asking us to change can be really hard but on the other hand there are people who come to university and that's when they get their official diagnosis or whatever and they're just thrown in this okay you need this this and this and I have no idea what would be appropriate in the university environment I think yes, there is a responsibility, and I think I believe that that's one of the things that James does. Is that not correct? Certainly, I used to do that when I was at Mount Hood. I would, what? I would, I would go through a fairly extensive exploration and, and explanation of alternatives and 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 testing of things that might work for the student. That deals with a student who's newly newly arrived at the assistive technology environment. Uh, the student who arrives with his or her own uh, IT and AT, I think, is a somewhat different case. And my experience, frankly, with those students is, in most cases, to the extent that they can operate independently off the network or accessing the network uh, wirelessly, that's, that's the preferable way for them to go, and they don't have to worry about university-sponsored AT, but your experience may be different. I think for, for my experience has been it's, it's somewhat disability specific. So if we have a student who is blind, then the, the screen reading software unless, and or refreshable to Braille are, are really the options. Now when we move into other disabilities, particularly low vision, there can be various not only settings within specific low vision software, but other types of low vision software that you'd want to try. And then, of course, then when we move into learning disabilities, it just it becomes it's on a spectrum, and we work closely with the student trying to find the keys that will help them get, you know, their academic success. Do you have one or more learning disability specialists on your staff, Lori? <laughs> I don't know how you define learning disability specialists, but um, well, my my no, my bench not. my benchmark was Cal State Northridge about 15 years ago when they had three PhD LD specialists. On we have staff. two PhD, but not LD specialists. <laughs> okay. Questions, comments, or shall we all go home? Another question behind you, James. I just want to make the comment that I've seen many uh, websites that uh, I'm not sure that they would be 508 compliant, but certainly, you know, by, by kind of looking, glancing or what little I know, it seems like they would be, except that they were full of links to picture-only PDFs, and so um, picture-only PDFs aren't Correct. right there, aren't accessible. Do you know if they were external so they links? Might, they or, might, do you know if they were external links or internal links? Uh, no. If they're university, if those are university pages, that's, I mean, that's, that's a legal problem, um, regardless of whether they're internal or external. I, the only reason I asked was that lots of times people, since it's so easy to create links, uh, lots of times people will create links to external stuff where they say, well, that's not my responsibility. I have no control over it, which is not legally correct. but. 
I have a question. It regards JAWS and the fact that it's not able to read everything that's on the screen. Mm -hmm. And if I'm hearing you correctly, the university's obligation extends to outside vendors. Um, say, I'm thinking like Lexis or Nexus if you're a law student or if you're an education student, PsychInfo or Academic Search Premier. When you get on those search engines to look up various articles, the buttons that are vis visible to other students are not necessarily visible to JAWS. So am I understanding correctly that the university would be obligated to require of that vendor that those types of problems be fixed? The university and all the other universities should be working with LexisNexis or the other vendors to, to, re to call those attentions, call those problems to their attention, insist that they be fixed. With LexisNexis, I'm, I have less experience with some of the other databases, and I know it's been an epidemic problem with accessibility in the university context, some of the databases, but LexisNexis uh, a knows better, and B, they got a lot of blind practicing lawyers out there who are subscribers and paying big money, and I'm surprised, frankly, that there are still uh, potentially significant issues. But the university's responsibility, you know, they've only got two choices um, in terms of legal research function, uh, pra as a practical matter. I don't know if the other one is more of a problem or less, more accessible or less accessible than LexisNexis. So they might be required to switch, but otherwise they've just got to be working with them. Okay, I should clarify, clarify that Lexis and Westlaw actually do a pretty good job for exactly okay. the reasons you point out. Okay. Um, I wish attorneys are, would work for some of the other databases that aren't as accessible, such as the um, Academic Search Premier and PsychInfo. And I don't want to pick on those because they may have actually improved since the last time I used them. Um, but it seems to be an ongoing problem with databases constantly upgrading their software. Uh, typically somebody forgets to check with the disabled community to make sure that it operates correctly with the upgrade. Yeah, they are, you know what, I, practically what I would suggest one do is file complaints with the Department of Justice because they have jurisdiction over those. And I, I'm very aware of how much of a problem it is. There's a guy in California, a, a assistive technology type, who's um, earned his doctorate on on exactly that issue. Um, but it's just like uh, publishers making e-text available, database issue is, a, is an analogous one. And um, it requires pressure from a lot of sources. Uh, including the Department of Justice, but certainly not limited. And I would say the university should be doing everything within their power to insist that the accessibility issues be repaired. I don't know how much fine, how much money is involved between the two, um, between the university and the publisher. But um, if there's a lot, there's concomitant weight to be thrown around. But that's how it's going to happen: complaints and 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 contracting pressure, it seems to me. Shall we quit? Thank you all. I've really enjoyed this. I hope it was helpful. Uh, my email address, or one of my email addresses, is on that handout and on the PDF. Uh, if you have questions about this or just stuff that comes up in the future that you think you'd, I might be able to be of assistance with, feel free. I don't charge. I charge for presentations, but I don't charge to just chat about a problem on the telephone at all. So, feel free. Thanks. <laughs>